I do have the Slido going again, if in case anyone wants to use the anonymous questions. Um, today we are going to uh, focus on the LSE reduction formula, which is a formula that relates um, scattering amplitude, right? Interested in? This is a scattering amplitude. Uh, it's the amplitude for some initial state to evolve in time to be some final state. So here, this is in the Heisenberg picture. Um, and our main um, result today will be a relationship between this scattering amplitude um, and a vacuum expectation value of a time-ordered product of field operators. So the LSE reduction formula relates these two things. This is what we're interested in computing. Our goal for the class is to figure out what happens if we have a, a relativistic uh, quantum scattering process. We send in some particles, uh, and we want to measure what, what comes out when both quantum mechanics and special relativity are important. This is our goal for the class. We specify our theory in terms of a Lagrangian that's formulated in terms of fields. So this object is easier to compute. Um, so that's, that's why this result is useful. It, it takes what we're interested in computing physically and relates it to uh, something we, that's more directly related to our formulation of the theory. Um, so that's where we're going to get today. And tomorrow we will finish the, the calculation. So this is um, a vacuum expectation value of a time-ordered product of fields in an interacting theory. So here omega is the ground state of the interacting theory. Uh, and in general, if we change the Hamiltonian, we'll change the ground state. So uh, we discussed the ground state of the free theory last time. Um, and that, that, that state in general will be different from this state omega, which is the ground state of our interacting theory where there's interesting scattering amplitudes to compute. Uh, and so what we'll do tomorrow then is relate this vacuum expectation value of the time order product of fields in the interacting theory to a vacuum expectation value in the free theory. And we'll do that by going to the interaction picture and using Dyson's formula, which you discussed with India. And, and finally, um, this vacuum expectation value can be related to a vacuum expectation value to few, two fields. I'm already a product of And this is closely related to what you were just discussing with David, um, the, the propagator. The Wick's theorem relates these two quantities. So by this several three-step process, we'll be able to compute what we're interested in um, by relating it to first an object we can compute in our, our theory and then simpler objects. Yes, Mary? Uh, I think I'm missing something. What is the T operator? This is the time ordering symbol. And what it means is that the time ordered product of two operators, I'll, I'll choose field operators, but it's true for any time dependent operators in general. So this is equal, time ordering symbol means put the latest operators to the left earliest operators to the right, and everything between in, in order. So this is equal to phi of x1, phi of x2, if x1, 0 
is greater than x2, 0. And phi of x2, phi of x1, if phi 1, 0 is less than. This is latest to the left. So that, that's where we're going um, both today and over the next two days. Um, and then on Wednesday, we'll see a more direct way to relate the propagator directly to the, the, the scattering amplitude. Or we won't quite get there. We'll get part of the way back um, using a equivalent technique to what we're going to do today and tomorrow. Um, but it's uh, a simpler in practice way, is Feynman diagrams. You can directly relate the, the propagator of that time ordered expectation value to either of these two quantities. So that's, that's where we're going. Um, and before we start our discussion of the LSE reduction formula, um, I want to say a few more words about the free theory. Um, we, uh, last time we discussed the vacuum state of the free theory. I just want to briefly say a few words about the states of particles um, and the Heisenberg picture. Um, as, as you might expect, here we're working in the Heisenberg picture. And here, all of these um, x's are four vectors. I haven't drawn any, any arrows in it. intentional. We'll be working in the Heisenberg picture today. and and relating the, the Heisenberg picture and the interaction. All right. Okay. So zero is, I'll reserve the zero to, to mean the ground state of the free Klein-Gordon theory. So the free Klein-Gordon theory has no interactions. Um, so it's important. And as we saw, there, there's interesting features of it, namely the, the ground state energy. Um, is one, one interesting feature that's rather surprising. But we want to study scattering. We are going to be looking at other theories. So we'll change our Lagrangian or Hamiltonian. And we'll do that um, in a way, we'll only be considering theories that are, in a sense, perturbations of this theory. Um, this step is not something we're going to be able to do exactly. Um, so over here, we're, I haven't specified a Lagrangian, but you can imagine a Lagrangian that's the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian plus some perturbation. Change the Lagrangian, you're changing the Hamiltonian, and in general, you're changing the ground state. Okay. So, um, in addition to the state we spent a lot of time talking about last time, the ground state, there are many other states in the Klein-Gordon theory. One of the simplest is a one particle state. With three momentum k. And this state can be constructed by acting with a creation operator, a k dagger, on the ground state. Um, so one particle state, uh, I won't do the derivations, but you'll, you'll look at that in the tutorial and on the quizzes. But the reason I say this is a one particle state, or it's reasonable to interpret this as a one particle state, is that if we act with the Hamiltonian on the state, we can find the uh, energy of the state. The state has energy ek squared is a squared plus m squared. 
exactly what you'd expect the energy for a one particle state to be. And um, you can also construct a momentum operator so that the state has momentum. Okay. So it's the expected properties you of a one particle state. Um, one thing that worth keeping in mind about these one particle states is that we've already chosen the normalization of our ground state. Ground state is unit normalized. And that means that our one particle states are not unit normalized. This is zero AK AP dagger zero, which we can compute just by using the commutation relations. And we get two pi cubed two K delta of J minus P. Um, and so this is a Lorenz invariant amplitude. We've chose um, our, our normalization choice for the for the field, and the creation and annihilation operators ensures that our um, our amplitudes are Lorenz invariant, and our states are all Lorenz covariant without any extra factors. Um, I we'll discuss that that fact much in much more detail in Q fifty one, but um, it's just the claim for now. You can see see from this expression um, that, that that's that's a reason reasonable thing to make. Okay. So these are our one particle states. We also have multi-particle states. States with multiple particles. Each particle has definite momentum. And we can get these states just by acting with n creation operators. In the vacuum. And because our creation operators all commute, particles in on Gordon theory are bosons. And we can construct a um, general state in this theory just by taking superpositions of these states. State space is spanned by the uh, n particle state. Um, okay, so those are the states of the theory. Just want to say a few words about the Heisenberg picture. These um, these operators commute with each other. So if I exchange I exchange k one with k two. Uh, they commute. They're, therefore, they're they're bosons. Oh, okay. That's what I'm saying. The um, so the Heisenberg picture. Heisenberg picture operators are time dependent. They're related to the Schrodinger pictures operators by multiplying by e to the iht on the left, e to the minus iht on the right. And so we discussed this detail with with Bindia. Um, for our purposes, I just want to comment briefly on the time dependence of the creation or annihilation operators. So the, we can, although this is not something we're going to do frequently, um, for reasons I'll discuss in just a minute, write down the Heisenberg picture version of the creation operator or annihilation operator. And, um, we can show using this definition and the BCH formula that this is just e to the si 
Okay. T times Schrodinger picture creation operator, or analogously for the annihilation operator, minus sign there. Um, and so that means if we plug this into our formula for the field operator, the field op Heisenberg picture field operator can be written as integral of the Lorenz invariant measure of a k uh, with no time dependence e to the i uh, minus i a dot x plus a k dagger e to the plus i a dot x again a zero equal to e k. Uh, so the time dependence here just combines with the um, exponentials we had before to get a, an exponential of four, four vectors. This is exactly what you'd expect based on our classical solution um, to get the Schrodinger picture operators. We just set t equals zero. And if we restore time, this is exactly the time dependence we'd expect. So in the free theory, these are time independent. Um, even though we're working in the Heisenberg picture. This is a four vector. Um, so, so that this just just follows from, from this equation that it's it's in general easier to work in terms of time independent creation and annihilation operators in the Heisenberg picture than this uh, this formula. Uh, how do we know e to the minus i h t is the uh, operator that generates time translation and just Klein quota, for example? Because the derivation of quantum mechanics depends on Schrodinger's equation. Um, yes, yeah, so we are we're, we're we're doing ordinary quantum mechanics. We're just dealing with a relativistic system. We're not we're not modifying any of our postulates of quantum mechanics. The, do all of the modes, individual modes, uh, satisfy Schrodinger's equation in a Klein order? Uh, my uh, is why is it e to the minus i Hamiltonian time even for the QFT? Not just uh, for the free theory. Yes, the we can, the individual modes are uh, independent, so so they satisfied independently. Schrodinger equation. Where did the other exponential go with the A dagger? Oh, so, so what I've done here is I've used the BCH formula. I, I've skipped some steps. BCH says that E to the A, B, E to the minus A is B e plus AB plus A, AB, uh, et cetera. And so each you can use the, the commutator, so we know that um, AK dagger. Hopefully, I'm not making some sign mistakes. Uh, is is uh, okay. Get the signs right. Uh, EK. I want to the other order. So you, using this, we can we, we can evaluate each term, and we'll, we'll get a ex, uh, a series expansion of an exponential. We can read some. That's right. And th this is this is not general. This is only for the Klein Gordon.
Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about the free theory. Let's move on to the LSZ reduction formula. This stands for um, Lehman, Samantic, and Zimmerman, uh, three physicists who originally found this formula. And our, our goal is to relate the scattering amplitude, F S I, to the vacuum expectation value, the time order product. So our goal to relate uh, F S I this expression. And in order to do that, um, let me say a few more words about what FSI means. First. So FSI, uh, this is our, our Heisenberg picture expression. You can also write this in the Schrodinger picture as a final state at T equals plus infinity. Um, so essentially, we're computing the overlap of this final state with some initial state at t equals minus infinity. Starting a picture expression. And here this time evolution, this is the time evolution operator. From t equals minus infinity, t equals plus infinity. And we'll be focused on the case where our states are momentum eigenstates. So in the free theory, these would be states that are created by creation operators acting on the vacuum. And um, we could have more than two particles in the initial or final state, but for today, let's focus on the case where we have two particles in the initial state. Um, so we want to write down states like this in an interacting theory. Um, we, we know how to do this in the free theory, but in order to do this in the interacting theory, we need to make some, some assumptions. Um, and we'll need to make further assumptions to relate the um, operators that, that will appear in our expressions for these states to the field operator. So, we're going to make a number of assumptions. Our first assumption will be that there exist some creation and annihilation operators. That satisfy the same commutation relations at equal time as our free annihilation operators. We'll assume these operators exist and that they satisfy at equal times the same commutation relation. This, this is a reasonable assumption. Um, there should be some operator that takes us to the from the vacuum state to a state with one particle at a, at, at a fixed time. Um, those operators should exist. Um, we don't know that they're the same operators at all times. So in general, there could be some time dependence. Um, but we, the, on physical grounds, we expect there, there should be some, some operator that, 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 that takes us from the one, zero particle state to a one particle state and back. Um, so we'll, we'll just give those some names and choose this normalization for their um, commutation relation. Hey, yes? Saying in, ge some in general uh, Lagrangian that has interactions, those it's a reasonable assumption to have creation and annihilation operators. That's right. So that's our, that's our first assumption. Um, that will let us define states like this. With that assumption, we can write down, say that our state 
uh, i is uh, a one dagger at minus infinity. Uh, sorry, in, the, in a shortening picture, this would be a one at zero. A two dagger zero and our vacuum state where a let me let me change notation for make this here. all this k three and k four with p one two where uh, a a i is defined b a k i I'm I'm just not going to write the the k's every time. What is a exactly e j there? Like, it's the eigenvalues of some counting system or something. Also, like why we allow to don't have any time dependency on the right computation relation between these operators that we're introducing. So we're, we're only assuming this holds at equal times. So t here is the same. Um, so at time t, for example. At time t, um, yes. This this is the this is the fit. We're we're going to demand that this is the physical energy. But this is physical energy. Of this. this is what we would get if we measured the energy of the one particle state relative to the vacuum state. But at time t. At time t. So with a, this assumption, we can write our initial and our final states as creation operators acting on the vacuum. Now, in order to relate what we want to compute, the scattering amplitude, something we can compute more easily um, if we're going to formulate our quantum field theory in terms of Lagrangian, um, which is a, a functional of fields, um, is that we need to have some way to relate these creation operators or field operators. Doesn't omega the grand state of the interaction theory? Yes. So the definition of final state. But interaction should be... So we don't have interaction that plus minus infinity. So here I'm writing down the Heisenberg picture states. Eisenberg picture states are time independent. So we have this time evolution operator S, which will act to evolve. You can think of it as evolving uh, F to plus infinity and I to minus. I wrote this down in the, the this state, F in the Schrodinger picture, all the time evolution would be in the state. So I would replace zeros here plus infinity. But we're putting, we're putting the time evolution in this explicit time evolution operator S. Okay. My next assumption is going to be that I of X acting on the vacuum is a one particle state. Uh, at least for t going to plus or minus infinity. Yes? Uh, maybe maybe go back for a, for a little. Um, I'm having trouble understanding what this omega does, actually. So when we go to O, I don't see you know, on the right side like, how, to, how to visualize it, like what it physically represents. Uh, so, so this is, um, so we're taking it, you can think about this as two parts. It has a vacuum expectation value. That means I'm sandwiching some operators between uh, the vacuum state. Um, and what, what's in between is, well, there's a time ordering symbol. Let's forget about that for a minute. But it's a product of fields. We're asking... Um, is there a, a correlation between the, the field value at different times, uh, different space time locations, not just time, space time locations? The time order means we're demanding that the operators are in a certain certain order. Um, but we're, we're at the question. This this is measuring the correlation between the, the field values at different points in space time. 
So if we're, if we're measuring, uh, if this were a, an electromagnetic field instead of a field, we'd be asking for, uh, to do a measurement of the electric and magnetic field at this point in space time and that point in space time are the, is our correlation or, or, or not. So that's the information. That's and why let me, do we let this act on the vacuum states? Um, well, we, we could, we could ask, th this quantity will, will, will come out of our calculation, but, um, more generally these correlation functions or correlation functions of the field, in, in fact, and contain all the information of the quantum, quantum field theory. But so by considering operators of this type, um, we can, um, by measuring operators of this type, we can get all the information about the, about the quantum field theory. That's something we'll discuss more in 52, but these, these operators are, um, have, have some inherent interest that, that we'll discuss later, that um, for now our purposes uh, of considering these objects is, well, we're writing our theory. Our theory comes from Lagrangian in terms of fields. If you want to calculate it, uh, much easier to calculate something in terms of fields than in terms of these creation mileage. Maybe one final question. Um, you said that we are trying to calculate how the different fields are correlated or different points of field. Mm -hmm. Are correlated and causally connected or? Not, not necessarily causally connected, but um, well, if this, if this were zero, then um, if I measure, uh, say it's the two point function, then that means I get no information about um, the measurement at the second space time point, if I know what's measurement is at the first space time point. If there's a correlation, then I have some information. So if you replace your correlation, Mm. Uh, from vacuum to some other states, some excited states. Um, if the correlation for omega turns out to be zero, would it also imply that it would be zero for all states? Because I not necessarily. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. So if this correlation turns out to be zero, would that also imply that if you replaced ket omega with some excited states, that would also be zero, or that is not a Okay. Not, not in general. Okay. Why did you assume that phi x, um, the, the effect of phi x on omega is in one particle state? Well, this is true in the free theory. Um, and if this is true in the interacting theory, that gives me a handle on how to relate the creation and annihilation operators to the field operators. Um, in particular, if this is true, that Sorry for interrupting, uh, but would, isn't phi acting on omega on the vacuum state even in the free theory as a proposition of one particle states? Because you have all the, the modes that you create. Uh, it's not a momentum eigenstate, but it is a one particle state. I can act, one particle state means I take the number operator, which is defined to be 3k, 2 pi cubed, 3k, a k uh, a k dagger. Um, so I take this operator and act with it on a uh, on this state. I get back one times the state. This this operator basically counts the number of creation operators in, in the system. So uh, th this op uh, both the states, aka dagger, acting in the vacuum, and phi of x acting in the vacuum are number eigenstates. The aka, aka dagger acting in the, the vacuum is a momentum eigenstate, phi of x is not. But they're both number eigenstates. Okay. okay, so in particular, this assumption tells us that at least asymptotically, phi of x should be linear in the creation operator.
Um, and if this field is real, it should also be linear in the annihilation operator. This should be Hermitian. So this, this assumption gives us a handle on how to relate phi and the ladder operators. Um, we need another assumption to fix the coefficients. And we'll assume that the form factor, which is a name for uh, k phi omega, is the same as it is in the free theory as it is in the interacting theory. And on the quiz, we haven't done it yet, but you'll show that form factor is e to the ikx for the free theory, and we'll assume that is also the case in the interacting theory. And th this assumption um, fixes the coefficients. So that, that tells us that there's an e to the i a dot x here and e to the minus i a dot x. Here, here we're in the Heisenberg picture. And compared to the free theory, the difference between this expression and this expression is that in the free theory, the ladder operators are time independent. In the interacting theory, there's some time dependence, some extra time dependence. We also have the um, time dependence in these exponential factors. Um, we could determine that time dependence, um, in principle at least, by um, using the, the Hamiltonian to determine the time evolution of these operators. In practice, that's difficult to do. Um, and this, this expression for the interacting theory came out of these assumptions. The free theory came from an explicit solution to the equations of motion. Um, so while the, f the formulas look different, where they come from uh, is, is rather different. And they do have this key difference that the, there's this extra time dependence interacting fields. So uh, near the end of the lecture, we'll, we'll look at whether it's reasonable to make these assumptions. But with these assumptions, we get this relation between the field and ladder operators. And we can use that then to relate FSI with this uh, correlation function for vacuum expectation value of the time ordered product of the A's and A vectors in the interaction theory are different than the quantum. Uh, yes. They, what, why do we differ them by A and A? They're, they're, they're different in the sense that they have different time, time dependence. Um, at a fixed time, they behave just like in the free theory. Um, but that, that extra time dependence is expected and, and crucial. Um, you create an, an interacting theory. Now let's suppose we have a theory where the k is allowed. And we should have, be able to have a one particle state that, uh, after some time evolution, becomes uh, not a one particle state anymore. It's a position of perhaps a one particle state and a two particle state. Um, if that particle can be the k. So we, we don't want uh, this operator to be conserved in general theory, and one way to, um, a natural way to implement that is to have time dependence and separation and annihilation operators. Yes, Rokas? Uh, sorry, just to make sure I understand sort of the bigger picture here. Are, are we making up phi's? Uh, are we making up some operator phi to be whatever, we want, whatever properties we want, such that we can come up with a nice formula that is a time order times a bunch of different phi's that is equivalent to our scattering am amplitude? That's right. Okay. But, but phi doesn't exist in S in any real way. Like phi, phi was just a separate made up thing. Uh, so, so this, this amplitude where we're trying to calculate the amplitude for some initial state to evolve to some final state. In order to compute the time evolution, we'll need to specify a theory. We're not doing that yet. Um, but we'd, one way we could specify S is by specifying a Lagrangian. Um, and that would allow us to compute S. Um, but here we're 
saying before we even make any assumptions about what particular theory we're looking at, what, what can we say on rather general grounds with some reasonable assumptions? I'm still a bit confused about why it's reasonable for phi of x acting on omega to be a one particle state because like phi is made up of this, you know, this integral over all of phase space, right? Or all of the d cube k. Um, that also includes like both creation and annihilation operators, right? Yes. Why is it fair to assume that you only have like one particle state as opposed to annihilating it or like a multi-particle state by acting phi? Uh, so we're, we're in only imposing this as one particle state at asymptotic times. So we want to do perturbation theory. Um, and if we're going to do perturbation theory, then it's, um, there, there should be, should be able to match our, our interacting theory to our, um, to our free theory that we're perturbing around in, in the asymptotic past and future. Um, if, we, if we looked at time evolution for a short time and we're starting with some perturbation around um, uh, the klein gordon hamiltonian or klein gordon lagrangian we just, the, for a short time evolution, it shouldn't be that different. And so we do time evolution for no time, starting with a state of the klein gordon theory. Um, we still have the klein gordon theory. That's this. This is reasonable, I think, to expect, assuming that perturbation theory works in this limit. In intermediate times, Maybe it breaks down. So it's like something, it's a boundary condition of sorts we're forcing onto R phi that we're. Yes, that's right. That's fine. K dot x here is a positive dot product. Yes. I mean, uh, it's basically it's basically the uh, Heisenberg picture phi of x, right? That's right. So uh, ak of t uh, implicitly has e to the power iota kt and then ak at t equals to zero. So, Shouldn't that be k vector dot x? No, th there's, there's time dependence in two spots. So this, this factor is the free theory time, time dependence, but there's some additional time dependence. We could combine these factors, but it'll be more convenient to, to leave it explicit in two, two spots. Like suppose we had phi at uh, t equal to 0. Then we, uh, then we won't have e to the power i, I e dot t because t is 0. And now we evolve this uh, using the Heisenberg picture. So then we'll have AK of T and AK dagger of T. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, I mean, why do we have K dot X as a pole vector? Um, so so this, this here is the Heisenberg. The, this is not, not quite the... Um, We've, we've chosen to write our time dependence here in a way to match this formula. So in this formula, uh, in the free theory, this is time independent. This is um, this, all the time dependence is in this factor. We could choose to break things up differently. It would make our life much more difficult. So um, I'm making that choice really for simplicity of where to put the time dependence. Also, Vincent said that the Hamiltonian is different for the Yes, our ham, our ham, I, I'm not. I am not going to specify a Hamiltonian or Lagrangian in this theory, but yes, it, it's it's something different. Okay. Sorry, I have more questions. Yes, Mary. The comment if real for the a of k t? Uh, if phi is real. Oh, I see. Which is the case we're considering now. Um, in tutorial tomorrow, we'll relax this assumption. I'm sorry, uh, where does the last assumption come from where inner product is equal to exponential something? So this is true in the free theory. Okay. And it's convenient to have some condition that allows us to determine these coefficients. So we'll, we're just going to demand that. So we can see it in the free theory if we try to, to construct this as well, right? Because I think we haven't checked it, but OK. Uh, you will check it in the quiz. Okay. It's a, a few line calculation.
Okay. So our FSI with these assumptions, we can write it in terms of the ladder operators, and it becomes a three of plus infinity or plus infinity a one dagger minus infinity a two dagger minus infinity and what we need to do is relate the ladder operators to field operators and given we have this formula uh, we can do that must have missed something. Um, so in the in the operator, the field operators we assume there. Um, so the annihilation operator would evolve with time, um, just like just as it should evolve in the Heisenberg picture. It'd be I K E K T times A K dagger. <clears throat> I think you replace that equation right in there. I think your time and defense is just kind of vanish. Isn't it? Because you have, let's say, e to the power of iota k dot x. So it is e to the minus iota e k t times e to the iota e k t there. This equation only holds in the free theory. Yes. Over here, we're working in the interactive. Okay, so now that was exactly the choice you made because you wanted to, uh, in the limit of free theory, you wanted that phi to give exactly that equation, so you did yes. Okay, so in order to relate the ladder operators to the field operators, um, there's, there's a useful identity discussed, and the result is that e one dagger uh, plus infinity minus A1 dagger of minus infinity minus i will be for x of e to the k1 dot x t squared m physical squared i of x. Did I get all the signs right? No, there's just a minus sign. And we can call this integral, um, call it I1 dagger. So that's a, that's a result. And we'll use this identity repeatedly to get our final result. Oh, that's a useful identity. Because when you took the dagger from F, it would be A4, A3. Uh, yes, it should. Okay. Yes. Why, why can you write the scattering amplitude as the actions of A4, A3, A1, A2, I, plus and minus I? So I'm just taking the assumption that our initial state is this, final state is that, and the time evolution operator acts to evolve the initial state back to minus infinity, the uh, final state to plus infinity. Or alternatively, if you write, write it down in the Schrodinger picture, you directly have. Um, the, the Schrodinger picture final state would be this state with the zeros replaced by pluses. Where did the identity come from? Uh, I'm going to prove it in a minute. But this, this, is, this is the key result. And before I, I derive it, just one comment. So here we've got the Klein-Gordon operator. So if this were a free theory, uh, this, this term would be zero. Klein Gordon operator acting on the field is be zero. It's our equation of motion. In an interacting theory in general, the equation of motion is different, so this will no longer be zero. And another key point is that this mass here is the physical mass.
Uh, at no point in today's lecture am I going to specify Lagrangian or Hamiltonian explicitly. Um, this will come out of the uh, relativistic dispersion relation. P squared is k squared plus m squared. So we, we won't need to assume anything about the Lagrangian. Or, or anything more than that the Lagrangian will satisfy those equations. OK. So let's prove this. So the first thing I can do is write this difference as an integral. Um, then I'm going to use a formula for a1 dagger t that a1 dagger t is the integral d3x of minus i the derivative of the minus i k1. Yes. Derivative. And so a1 uh, is equal to this minus i integral of this times d0. I of x plus I e k I of x. And so this, this expression um, is the same relation between a dagger and phi uh, as in the free theory. Um, in, in one of the quizzes, you'll derive that if you haven't already. And the fact that phi has this form and that uh, phi is a, is a one particle state, it's t goes to plus or minus infinity, um, Im implies that the same, same derivation you'll, um, you'll work, you, you, you'll do in the quiz, in the free theory works for the interacting theory. Um, you'll need the additional assumption that um, the time dependence goes to zero. To, to make the assumption that time dependence goes to zero at plus or minus infinity. With that extra assumption, your, your derivation for the free theory will work. You get this, this expression um, for the ladder operator. Um, we can do the derivative. Four terms, two of them will cancel, um, and I'll be left with so minus i k one dot x d zero squared minus e k squared. K1 or K1, uh, K1 yeah. Should be plus. So that there are two other terms, they'll cancel. And here I can relate using relative dispersion relation, E K squared to be K squared plus M squared. This is the physical mass, not assuming anything about the Lagrangian. Place that with the, this, and I get e to the minus so minus i k one dot x. I can integrate by parts twice to replace the k squared with a um, spatial derivative.
and then I can combine these time and space derivatives to get the Gaussian four dimension. Okay, so that's where this derivation comes from. And with that useful identity, we just need a few lines to get the LSE reduction. So our expression, FSI, is omega A4 of plus infinity 3 plus infinity dagger. And this expression is already time ordered. Or I'm not changing anything if I insert time ordering symbol here. I then use the useful identity. I get uh, two to the four terms. I won't write them all down, but I'll, I'll just write down two of them. So if I use the useful identity, I'll have a term uh, where uh, so we'll replace these a, a uh, these ladder operators with ladder operators that um, are opposite. If it's a plus infinity, I'll replace it with a ladder operator minus infinity plus um, the integral. So if I just looking at the terms of the ladder operators, I'll have a term a four of minus infinity, a three of minus infinity. A1 plus infinity, A2 at plus infinity. There'll be many mixed terms with some A's and some I's. And then at the end, there will be a term that's I4, I3, I1. Dagger I2. And claim is that this term will vanish. Um, this term is a time ordering symbol that moves the annihilation operators to the right, because they're at the earliest times, so they'll annihilate the vacuum. It'll also move the creation operators to the left. That will annihilate the bra vacuum. This term vanishes. Something that I didn't understand then, uh, where did the time fall during in the first one came from? Uh, the expression was already time ordering, ordered, so I haven't changed anything if I insert it. Can you explain again why was the first term zero? Uh, so this time ordering symbol pushes A4 and A3 to the right because those are at minus infinity where they annihilate the vacuum. And the same for the uh, creation operator, so annihilate the raw vacuum. And that's true for all the terms here that have at least one creation operator or annihilation operator. All of these terms are zero. And we're only left with this last term. Uh, and so this gives us our expression for the LSE reduction formula. get a factor of i from, from each of these expressions. We'll have integral before psi. Oops, let's call this j. Then we have e to the minus i times of j. Kj dot xj. We have a d squared j plus m squared. Finally, the 
promised uh, vacuum expectation value of the time order product of fields. And let me just take a minute to explain the notation. So here, lambda j plus 1 for initial states and minus 1 for final states. And by dj squared here, I mean uh, d squared dx. Um, J D A to me now X J new. So this is the Laplacian with respect to um, X J and phi I I mean phi at X I. This is our key result. The difference in the sign between the initial and final states comes from the fact that the i's and i daggers um, have a, a different sign here. I take the conjugate of this sign, I'll change. So, so that's our key result related the scattering amplitude you want to compute to this vacuum expectation value we can compute. This is a good spot to take a break. Let's uh, break for five minutes. Okay. So I'd like to spend some time discussing how reasonable it is to make these assumptions and what, what that tells us about our theory. Yes, Mary. We'll talk about this later after class since we don't have much time, but why again are the uh, the terms like a four minus infinity, a three minus infinity, like those terms? Why are they all zero? Uh, because of the time ordering symbol, which pushes the annihilation operators to the right, because all of our annihilation operators, after we've used the useful identity, um, are at minus infinity. So at the, at the earliest possible time, time ordering pushes the earliest times to the right, uh, and vice versa for the operators. So let's let's check. Um, let's discuss our assumptions and how reasonable those are. We made a number of assumptions. So the five x is asymptotically a one particle state. So if it's a one-particle state, that, what does that mean? That means, well, it should be orthogonal to the zero-particle state, the vacuum. So we should have that vacuum expectation value of the field is zero. Um, it should also be orthogonal to multi-particle states. Uh, and our other assumption was that the form factor, k phi omega, was e to, e to the i k x, the same as it is in the free theory. Okay. So let's um, see, or think think more carefully about about these assumptions. What what can we say in general about the vacuum expectation value of a field? Of the scalar field. Well, we're, we're assuming our theory is um, Poincare invariant. Um, so this, can, one thing we can do is we can write 5x as some translation operators times the field operator at zero. This is the translation operator. So we can think about this equation as a generalization of the relationship between the 
um, Heisenberg picture and the Schrodinger picture. Um, got, can tra translate the field by putting these exponentials of the translation operator. And if we plug this into the vacuum expectation value, what we see is that omega 5x omega is omega 5 0 omega because the vacuum by assumption is translation. So that tells us that this vacuum expectation value is not a function space-time, it's, it's a constant. At, at any point in space-time, it's equal to the value of this zero. Um, and because by construction our, our amplitudes are all Lorentz invariant, this is just a Lorentz invariant number. So, well, we write down an arbitrary theory. It's not necessarily true that the vacuum expectation will be zero. Uh, in general, the vacuum expectation will just be some complex number. So there's an easy fix, an easy way we can modify our theory so that it has no vacuum expectation value. Why is it more It's not something we've uh, we have or will discuss in, in great detail, but the, the claim is that all of our amplitudes in this course are Lorentz invariant because of the way we've chosen to normalize things. Basically, our uh, fields will transform trivially under Lorentz transformations. So um, you, you will build up um, machinery of how to perform Lorentz transformations on these states in, in general in, in QFT1. Those states are invariant amount of time and spatial translations, temporal. Yes. Uh, but um, is that also an extra assumption? Because is that also an assumption? Th that's also an assumption, yes. We're, we're, assuming, we're assuming our vacuum state exists and is Poincaré invariant. It's a reasonable assumption. What? Why is it reasonable? I mean, uh, isn't there just a particle uh, be created out of thin air? Uh, well, experimentally, we, we've never seen a preferred reference frame. The vacuum state had non-trivial non transformation properties that would be hard to... An experimental intuition. So, so we can fix this problem if, if, for some reason, the theory we write down initially has a vacuum expectation value. Um, then we can't use the... LSD reduction formula as we, in the form we've written it down, but there's an easy way we can change our theory to make the, this assumption hold. So we can define a new field operator, 5x, which is our original 5x minus v. So phi has a vacuum expectation value, phi tilde won't. Uh, so we can shift. And we'll assume we do this, and I'm going to drop the tilde going forward. So we can make this assumption work just by doing a shift. But this is true only at t equals plus minus infinity, phi theta. This holds for all time. This is for all t, for all x. We, we, actually, we don't, um, actually only need this to be 0 at plus or minus infinity, but we get for free that uh, if it's zero plus or minus infinity, it's zero for all time. So, sorry, did you, did you time like is that is that a four vector translation? Yeah. Yes, this is this is a four vector translation. Okay, um, let's let's move on to this this assumption next. Do the same sort of analysis for the form factor. 
just another name for this expression. Um, so if we rewrite phi of x in terms of phi of 0 using space-time translations, we get is that this equal to a e to the i e dot x phi of 0 e to the minus i e dot x omega. Can you just check the um, first part of the assumption? What happened to the second one? Because I'll discuss this later. Okay. Uh, we're doing this the first, it, the second. Uh, we'll do this one third. This is uh, more challenging. Um, one and three follow for, follow from this, um, but in a sense, one one is talking about the o, uh, overlap of by omega with a zero particle state, two is talking about its overlap with the one particle state, and three is with a particle state. There is a reason, another reason that this order makes sense. Okay, so this part we can simplify. What is this? Omega. Omega, yes. Um, now this part. Doesn't just give us k. k. K transforms non-trivially. If we transform k, we'll get an e to the i k dot x k f i of zero. And so this is the factor we want. If this this extra factor here were one, our assumption would be satisfied. In general. This is not one, um, but as I've claimed many times, and I'm not going to, to prove in this course, all of our amplitudes will be Lorentz invariants. So this is a Lorentz invariant function, which can depend only on k, k squared. And in fact, it's going to be Lorentz invariant function of k squared. The only thing it can possibly have any dependence on. Uh, that's also a function of k squared is equal to m squared. So this is not, not actually a function of k. Independent. So again, this is just a Lorentz invariant number, not a function. So uh, I can write this as e to the i k x times some function I'll call 1 over n. It's a number I'll call 1 over n. Um, so in general, the functionality of k, I'm sorry. The, the claim is that this is Lorentz invariant. Yeah. So if it's Lorentz invariant, um, it can only depend on k squared. Right. k is the only argument here. But k squared is equal to m squared. So k squared does not actually depend on k for a physical particle. Mm -hmm. So that, that means it's just a number. It's independent of k, independent of x. Why do you claim that that's Lorentz invariant at the start? Because we, as you said, it's just can all, can only be a function of k squared. Why can't it be a function of k? That's it. Then it wouldn't be Lorentz invariant. How would you know that it's not? Uh, you, we'll look uh, in QFT one. You'll look at how how all of these operators transform under Lorentz transformations. Um, that's that's a claim claim for now. You'll you'll spend a week or more uh, on that topic, so it's too much to, to go over in a few minutes here. Okay, so in general, this um, is not just e to the i k x. E to the i k x times some, some number. Uh, so again, our assumption for the LSE reduction formula is not automatic, but it's rather easy to fix. So before we shifted to get rid of the unwanted constant, here we can do something similar. What should we do to, to get rid of this unwanted constant? How should we re redefine I of x? 
right, we should, it should be uh, n. I'm sorry. Rescale. And so then we can, we'll just assume we do this. So you can drop the tilde. So these two assumptions uh, are not automatically satisfied, but they can, we can make our theory satisfy these assumptions by shifting and rescaling. Is the rescaling the same thing as redefining our units of measurement? Um, because not, I see that the Lagrangian would be invariant under that transformation, but the Lagrangian won't have the same form if I yeah. scale my fields. It's not, not the same thing as engineer units, not in general. I, I don't. I mean, so the transformation has to leave the, the Lagrangian invariant, right? No. We, we, we're, we're not demanding that our Lagrangian is, is invariant. We're trying to make our field um, satisfy the assumptions, the LSC reduction. But what if they describe different physics than the one we started with? But we can transform the fields as. The, so so that, that's. Um, if, you wanted to, uh, if you want to make. If you want the action to be an extremum, I don't think that would make a difference, right? Because if you only, if it if it's just proportional to multiples of phi, phi squares, stuff like that, you could just factor out the n, and then still take the variation, set it equal to zero. Is that is that because the, the physical meaning wouldn't change if you just rescale phi in that way? So the Lagrangian might not be, um, might not be exactly the same. But the action wouldn't change. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so in, okay. I'll, I'll just make a brief comment, and I want to say some other thing. But I'm happy to continue the discussion after class. Um, it, it's in general the, the physics doesn't change um, if you do a field redefinition. That, that's not at all obvious from what we've done. Um, it will be much more obvious in the path integral formulation. Um, but uh, I, I do, I do want to. Move on. I happy to continue the discussion after class. Uh, af after class, well, um, so, so my apologies, but I want to say just a few more words before we finish. And, and we did we did start a few minutes late, so but I'll, I'll be uh, quick. Okay, oh, I just moved it, but this one turns out to be automatic. For massive particles, there are details in the lecture notes. I'd be happy to discuss those uh, further with anyone who's interested. Um, this is uh, more, more technical to show this, uh, but it, the result is that that's automatically satisfied. Okay, so let's suppose we want to apply LSE reduction formula to a theory with interactions. So one theory we could write down, we just take the Klein-Gordon theory, and add, add a new term, an interaction term. Say we want to have a field where three particles can interact same point in space time. So this seems like a reasonable thing to do. But if I write down this theory, it doesn't satisfy the assumption of the LSC reduction formula. So I'm, I'm not justified in studying this theory with the LSC reduction formula. Instead, um, I, can, I can almost do that, but I need to shift and rescale. And then after that shifting and rescaling, and I'll also rename some of our parameters, our, our theory in general will look like some extra factor in front of our kinetic term. This term is the, I'll call it the kinetic term, even though it has a gradient part as well. An extra term in front of our mass term, 
we'll have an extra coefficient in front of our interaction. And we can also get a new term. We'll get a new phi dependent term. Shifting the field, we'll generally get a linear term and, and constant terms, which won't affect anything. So I'm not going to write that down. So, so th this is not a form of Lagrangian we can use in general to do perturbation theory. And in, in general, we're going to have to do something like this. And if we use the LSE reduction form to compute our, our scattering amplitudes, that will impose constraints on these coefficients, the z's and the y's. Um, Besides through scaling and shifting, so isn't there right now, don't you have a few constraints on z, phi, z, m, and z, g? Yes, and we'll look at those constraints, constraints explicitly um, near the end of this course. Um, but th this is something you generally have to do, and, and, and this is related to renormalization. Renormalization is required if we want to use the LSE reduction formula. So the assumptions we made for the LSE reduction formula will put some constraints on the, Z, the Zs and the Ys. Um, we're going to ignore this fact for now, but we'll come back to it in a few lectures. But for now, we will assume that the Zis are all 1 and the y's are all zero. And this will, this in general will be true at leading order in perturbation theory. Um, so that, that we're going, going to make this, keep, keep in mind that we have to do this. I'm going to go beyond leading order, but we're going to uh, ignore it and develop the perturbation theory um, without worrying about this first, and then add, add this in at, near the end of the course. So is the LSC reduction formula only valid to leading order and perturbation theory? Uh, it's valid at, at beyond leading order, but these the z's and the y's will not be 1 or 0 beyond leading order. Okay, um, thank you. Um, apologies for going slightly over time. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to answer any other questions or further discussion.